I've put together approximately 35, maybe 37 videotapes, and the only information comes from a book dictated to me by God as his righteous servant, a man described in Isaiah 53, and a man described in chapter 11 of Isaiah, the descendant of David, the twig. From a shoot that grows out of the stump of Jesse, and it is a stump because of the banished and felled ancestral tree of the kings of Judah, the line of Jesus. He cannot be the man of chapter 11. He's not the anointed one. He's not son of David. None of that's true. The other book, that book is called Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. And there's about three chapters in those particular videotapes uh, that come from the second book that we wrote not too long ago. He dictated to me the story of my life. It's to show you how I fit the verses of Isaiah 53 with regard primarily to uh, suffering, familiar with disease. So that would be wounding, wounded, and... Uh, as it turns out, cancer. But the other words that you find in Isaiah 53, um, punishment, maltreatment, crushing, bruising, chastisement. Okay, that is all in God's power. That's all in God's power, all those words. But <clears throat> the books were unpublished, you know, shunned and despised, the kind of afflicted uh, <clears throat> by God played. Nobody understands it. This is so different than the Judaism the Jewish people have been taught. This Messianic era that will never occur. And we know it's not going to occur now once you believe who I am and how you can know. After the mountain of evidence I have presented that is in those books, just, just as Moses today would have to say, well, look, you know, I wrote Leviticus. You think I just came up with that? You think I just came up with all this information? Did I know how God speaks through an angel and who that angel is? Moses walks by a burning bush that's not consumed. The angel of the Lord's in the bush and God speaks. I'm the one who explained that to you. I shouldn't have to go any further than that. The God says the rabbis, the shepherds, they never listen to my prophet. They think they know everything. Well, I'm going to keep showing that they don't. This is primarily for the people who listen to them and not them. I don't expect them to ever respond. Because by responding, they have to say they've been wrong. Or that's just not what we believe. And so they won't change. The bottom line is they make money on it. That's the bottom line. God had me watch a, a video of Toby Singer just for this one purpose I'm about to tell you. He said, watch him raise his hand. He raises his hand to do his hair or rub his nose or something. And it's this big, big, fat gold watch. And this is how you know this is a God of old. He said, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I said, well, he does dive. You know, he skin dive, scuba dive. It might be a scuba watch. He said, that's no scuba watch. That's just a big, fat, gold watch for everyone to see. And he makes his money on Isaiah 53. The guy says, well, at least that's how he really got going. I don't know. I know he has a radio show. But uh, it, remember, I'm in the fire refinement. Everything God does with me is to draw emotions because I'm going to be emotionless once I get to Israel. For the most part. He'll let me feel what he wants me to feel. But uh, nobody can get under my skin. You can't bother me. Even if I seem like I'm mad. It, it doesn't carry over to my insides. And I don't I don't think about it any more than while I'm, uh, you know, as I would say today, on a rant. Getting on somebody. But, you know, I bring his reckoning. I laugh. I tell him, you know what I am, don't you guys? He said, I know you're a lot of man. I said, no. I'm the reckoning, and I am the wreck. That's what I am. <laughs> he laughed. Holy Spirit laughed. 
That's what, yeah. I said, you know, righteous servant, uh, David the shepherd, Elijah, prophet like Moses. You know, I like wrath. What's his name? Wrath. What does he do? He brings a reckoning. But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm going to go through these early years of mine before God spoke to me. It's chapters 1 through 6. Chapter 7 is an eight, uh, God Speaks to an Atheist, and I've already videotaped that. Walking with God and uh, something on visions and visuals. So the, the first chapter, this what he told me to write down, write down uh, Birth and Tragedy. I was born in Bryan College Station, Texas on February. <laughs> this just then from the Holy Spirit, yes. Like he couldn't ask me before I started. Yes. Oh, this is only for the people who come to believe me. I don't expect anybody who's been viewing these materials and, you know, nobody's really subscribing a handful. Um, to, to be believed. Again, I can't imagine. I don't know what you people want. I don't know who you think is going to come to do something different. How are you going to know who David is? I mean, according to Judaism, there is no description of him. How are you going to know who he is? All this being presented, and I know Jewish people have seen it, only 60% of the views are coming from the United States. Now, I don't know that that means 40% is coming from Israel, probably not. you got Canada that would be a big follower on my WordPress site. And uh, it really just all the countries of the world at one time or another have looked at some of this information as I wrote my blog, and the blogs became chapters. Um, but I'm assuming some Jews have heard of what some man is saying he is, must yet. And they're watching. Well, this is for those who come to believe. The people who want to be the witnesses, the many made righteous. By my knowledge, by the things I can tell you that God would have me say to you. So, uh, you know, this might be bored to tears with others, but it does show suffering, pain, and uh, emotional pain, my background, and uh, just who I am. Not just some kook out here. You know, you know, people say, well, he's hearing voices. I mean, listen, as a lawyer, I ain't even did criminal law. I've seen some of these people who hear voices. I promise you, you know that's a person who should be hearing voices when you just see them and watch them for a couple of minutes. That's not me. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I was born in Bryan College Station, Texas on February 21st, 1957. And that's interesting because that's the year the first satellite went up. Russia sent up Sputnik, which was really three different satellites, and all together they were called Sputnik. Uh, that is considered the dawning of the age of the Internet. Now, I've asked God, how did you select me? How did I be, be blessed with this and learning all these things with this crazy life that I've had? And, uh, but he won't answer me. <laughs> he says, he's gone poker. This poker guy, he's not going to talk. He's not going to change the expression or anything. Or me getting an impression that he is. Um, and, and so I tried to come up with it on my own, and that is where I started. I said, because I know how important the internet is for this. It's the only way to get things worldwide then. And, and all the teachings that have, been, have come through it, uh, I didn't know, you know, I'm 63. Uh, I'm not like the young people who can just text messages without looking at you know, looking at the phone and all that. But he's taught me everything. He taught me how to set up Facebook, Twitter, uh, you name it. And uh, he would just say, "Go to your computer, do this, do that." You know, commanded it and directed to become very good uh, at the computer and, of course, word processing. You know, I'm a regular uh, secretary, except I still henpeck with one finger. I used to, but uh, God said that's to show you I have perfect use of this uh, disfigured right arm. It just doesn't have muscle in it, and my shoulder's short. Anyway, I was born in Bryan College, and that's where Texas A&M University is. And uh, that, my dad was attending Texas A&M when I was born. Um, 
I gradu graduated from there 22 years later, which is a story in and of itself. So I was born premature in the seventh month of my mom's pregnancy. I was born in February, and there were many complications. My parents were told I would not make it through the night, and they should just take me home. Mind you, this is 63 years ago. The biggest problem was that my insides had not fully formed, and it was impossible for me to take milk. Mammy, my great-grandmother, told my parents, boil rice. Feed him the rice water. It's got all kinds of nutrients and minerals in it. Dad says he threw out a mountain of rice those first few months. And it would not be my last encounter with death. So my dad graduated and we moved to Metairie, Louisiana. Uh, and his first job is an oil and gas geologist. He looks for oil and tries to sell deals to people who can raise money to drill. It gets money up front and the percentage of production once they get their money back. That's what he's done his whole life. And I became, as a lawyer, as a lawyer, I became board certified specialist in oil, gas, and mineral law because I had found it so interesting. He just, as a young boy, I became interested. But he rarely had time for us. <laughs> the, the other part, I said, okay, well, I was born with the, the dawning of the internet, so he's got a selection process for 57. And I come from a dysfunctional family. Lots of drinkers, lots of fighters. And on my mom, my mom, her grandfather committed suicide. I'm looking at this, it's tragedy. Earth and tragedy, tragedy. Um, in the Great Depression, he lost everything. He owned land in what is now downtown Dallas. But, um, but then when she was about four or five, her mother went down to the Market Square in Crockett, Texas, small East Texas town. Everybody has their courthouse in the center of town and there's streets on either side with stores. She went to the hardware store and purchased wreck poison. She hadn't gotten hardly out the door when she opened it and took it herself. Died right there on Main Street in the middle of the day in a little small town. I don't know how long that would have been. My mom's 85 or 6. Uh, she was 4 or 5. You know, almost 80 years ago. So, um, I'm sure it was quite an event. And her dad uh, took her and her sister, her sister's about 2 years older, to uh, Metairie, and, uh, not Metairie, to uh, someplace in Louisiana. But, uh, could have been Baton Rouge. And um, her father became a elevator operator. And you can still find this in Houston when I was at law school. I went to law school downtown Houston. Mm -hmm. But uh, South Texas College of Law. And at the courthouse, they, they would have somebody sitting in there on a little stool and with a lever and take you up or down, take everybody up or down. You know, with all the lawyers coming in for the court cases, it was packed. Um, I'm, I'm sure they've done away with it by now. But that's what he did. And uh, they found him one day or night. Uh, he had taken out a pistol and shot himself in the head and killed himself. So now she had suicides on both sides of the family. And uh, her father's brother took, a, took the two girls in. He actually adopted them, and uh, when she was about 10 or so, I believe, uh, she's with him out in some shack in East Texas, and, uh, you know, there's not even phone in this place, and he took a shotgun, and I'm sure he'd been drinking there all known for it, and uh, blew his head off right in front of her. And that's all the circumstances I know about. It doesn't sound like a good scene at all, but it scarred her for life. Okay, we've been taking care of her from the get-go. My father amazes me to no end. What, what he has done to, take, to care for her. See, they knew he, that, that, they, that was his sweetheart. Eventually, now at 10 years old. That's who he married. And they're both from Crockett, Texas. Small town people. I still take care of them. They've taken care of me for 10 years. <laughs> Got to me from society. He made me quit law. 
terminate my law license in Hawaii and Texas and uh, took me into poverty. I've been in poverty for 13 years until I just now filed for Social Security early. Uh, but I give them more than 90% of it to, to make up for everything they've given me for 10 years, 13 years. Uh, while I'm in God's fire of refinement, learning everything I need to know. And I have learned much. There ain't any question. So anyway, there's three suicides. There's four suicides right there. So it's a family of tragedy. You know, it's a tragedy of losing your entire family in the Holocaust. And you're the only one left. It's not like that. But as God says, I just got things as close as I could. He says, I touched you in the womb to destroy you, really for just one reason. Well, two reasons. One, it makes you identifiable. But it was so people would pick on you. I wanted people picking on you because that's what happens to young Jewish boys. Just for being Jewish. Just for having a disfigurement. People will pick on you. I've told him since. I don't even really recall many people saying anything to me. He said, that's because you look like you crawl all over them if <laughs> they did. And I did. I, always, I was always just say something, anything. That's just the way I, I was just angry inside. And God's taken all that away. <clears throat> but I can still go on a good rant. But, um, and then my mother in the 60s, uh, young people may not know this, but that, that's when, you know, the Woodstock and marijuana, LSD, everything started getting big. And at the same time, doctors were just handing out pills left and right. Valiums, painkillers, Percocets. You know, just asking for it. They were writing scripts. And I know today they put a lockdown on that. But uh, she got heavy into it and drunk all the time. I had to come from school and stay with her. And, um, and she became such a different animal, a different person when she drank. She became a little girl. You know, and having your mom act like that and slobbering and, you know, going there to be valium dripping out of her mouth with a bottle of booze by her. So it was an ugly scene. And uh, so I came from a dysfunctional family, so I think God, and God wanted that. And he's there with me from my first year to make sure that I live a life of suffering. He orchestrated many of my wounds, and he's taking me back in vision to see these things. And his vision is that one thing you don't pick up in, in, in the Bible, when I say Bible, I'm talking about the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, that's not, um, unless I say otherwise. Which is like when God says, my peoples. If he just says, my peoples, he's talking about the Jewish people, the chosen. I mean, he may say uh, uh, the peoples of Moab, uh, or just by the context, you know, he's referring to another group. But that that uh, that comes up all the time. So uh, to add to that, she tried to kill herself a few times. And when I was ten, my dad was at a Texas A&M game in Dallas, and I know it was 1967, so I was ten years old. Because I'm very familiar with that particular game. It was against Bear Bryant and Alabama Crimson Tide, and he had coached at Texas A&M. So uh, as you can tell, me and my dad are big. Uh, Aggie fans and football fans, but <laughs> they, I had been sure we'd be able to see those games in Israel. Somehow, it might be taken away. He said, we'll get it. That's the Holy Spirit. We'll get it. I said, he's so funny. Um, I don't know where my sister and brother were, but um, I heard some noise, and I went down about one or two in the morning, and uh, our stairs curved, and there was a bay, little bay window cut out, and I looked down out into the living room, and she's laying newspapers out, and I just sat there watching, didn't know what to do. And uh, she got down that paper and took out a butcher knife, not a razor blade, a butcher knife, and opened her wrist up. And um, this happened again years later when I was in high school, she opened her elbow up, and that was god awful. Um, uh, but 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 before she bled out, my dad opened that door. I sometimes think she knew he was going to be there soon, would probably save her. But it didn't look good, and I hated myself for not doing something. Maybe that's why I was so angry. Anyway, um, because I didn't do anything, I just sat there. 
I couldn't move. I don't know. I don't even know what I was really thinking, really. But um, I can't. What it did is it told me how much her uh, uncle blowing his head off must have done to her. That that must have it really hit you. <clears throat> I had nightmares my whole life, but. Um, I was 16 when she did the thing with the knife. Uh, but you know what? My dad finally got her to, he got her the best psychiatric care in Houston, Texas. And that's big because we got a medical center that's renowned throughout the world. And they, they put me back together many a time. And uh, she never did that again. And the amazing thing is, is how different she is in her very advanced old age. I mean, it's like she was never that person of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I didn't know how my dad survived it. I'd have never stayed. I'd have taken the kids and said, try to find us. But uh, he's not out there. I've never seen two people who love each other so much. <laughs> it's just, it's crazy. <clears throat> but anyway, I was married for 20 years and we weren't like that at all. We finally divorced for irreconcilable differences. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, my first major surgery is when I was two years old. My first surgery. Up above here, I have a scar. I had my first of many surgeries. Been born without my right pectoral muscle. Small shoulder, withered arm. And then there was some, my, my, the movement of my arm was restricted. There was some tissue in here that had to be cut out. So they opened me up and did that. I was born right-handed, but I, I do everything left-handed. Uh, except for light things, like I shoot a basketball right-handed, uh, I throw a ball right-handed, darts, things like that, but bowling, I'm left-handed, you know, anything heavy. And uh, I was I was quite an athlete. If I'd had two good arms, I, I'd have probably been on scholarship. I, I was already offered a partial scholarship at a small school for track, even with this bad arm, but you just, you, you, you just, I just didn't have the fast start. You got to have two strong arms just pushing out in front of you. But I was some kind of quick and fast. So, um, we moved back to Houston to a place called West University, a suburb. And uh, <laughs> this little story, I don't even like telling it, but God tells me I have to. And uh, he had something to do with it. But I'm not going to go into that part of it. Uh, so anyway, I had decided when I was in second grade, I was tired of school, didn't want to go anymore. I don't exactly know why. I just know I said, that's it, and I'm not going. Dad came to take me, get me up and take me to school, and told him I'm not going. And it was on. He was going to get me there. It took him about an hour to get me to the car. Fighting and screaming and running around and hiding and getting under bed. <laughs> you name it, I was doing it. And uh, anyway, he finally gets me to the school, but uh, he's too tired. He wasn't even going to try to get me out of the car by himself. So he get out, and he goes and gets the principal. Now, my dad's about 6'2", but he's real slim. And uh, But he comes out with his principal, who's taller than he is, and he's a hefty guy. He's burly. Anyway, so they come, they say, get out of the car. I said, not getting out of the car. <laughs> I'd already locked the doors. Now only the two front doors locked, and it was those locks that you pull up and push down. And so uh, my dad used the key, and he opened up, he popped that lock up, and I slammed it back down. He said, I'm not going to school, I told you. <laughs> he threw some keys, they started throwing the keys at one another over the roof. And the principal was trying the same thing, and I'm slamming his door, I'm leaping across the car, bam. I don't know how long I went, but they finally, you know, in five minutes maybe, seemed like an eternity. I was terrorized. That's the way I looked at it. Anyway, the principal got it open, and I saw that door open, and I, I got back on the far other side of the, behind the, by the steering wheel with my back against the, that door, I curled up like a ball, had my, my knees on my chest, and he reached in <laughs> to get me. And I unleashed on him, kicking him in the face with everything I had. He broke his glasses, and his orbital bone got shattered. So, you know, 
That wasn't my first principal either. There's another one. So, uh, but anyway, so they carried me in, and it was very embarrassing. Just crying. But again, funny thing, nobody, because I stayed with this same group for nine years, going to West University and, and, and the junior high there that you go to. Uh, nobody ever said anything to me about it. And I knew some of those kids I, that were in that class. Listen. My camera only goes for half an hour. It's, I can see on the screen that I have point towards me that when it runs out, I have to turn it off and turn it back on. But uh, but anyway, uh, that ended uh, my fight with the, my first principal. Yeah, here it is right here. I guess God had me put these together. In the 10th grade, the principal of the school told me to cut my hair. You know, I had long, blonde, wavy hair, well past my shoulder. Again, this was, you know, I graduated high school in 76, and uh, this has been junior high, so it's in the early 70s, but it felt like the 60s still. And I kept in a ponytail. It was neat. It was a school-wide policy. I think I was one of the last people to cut his hair. I was hiding all the time. <laughs> I was always on the alert for the teachers that would turn you in. But um, I went and got it cut. I told the barber right at my collar. Sat there in the chair, cut it right at my collar as I was instructed to do. And then I was commanded to return to the principal's office. And um, so I presented myself to him, I sat down in the chair in his office, and he gets up, walks behind me, and grabbed me by my hair, back of my head, and jerked my head back fast. And said, it's still over your collar. Now, I don't know if I did a backflip out of that thing. I can't really recall. But what I do recall is it took three people to get me off of him. And I was permanently expelled from school which ended up me leaving home. It wasn't a runaway, I'm just out of here. I'm tired of everything and everybody. I ain't going to school ever again. Hates go always there. That was me. And they had to pull me off of him. I understand to a friend of mine, he said, you know, my brother went to that school. He had some stories about that guy. And so I said, it wasn't me, it's him. Uh, second major surgery came when I was 12 years old to try and repair my right knee and just below it. I was running full speed in a field. Uh, it, high grass and weeds uh, with a family dog. And God says he had something to do with what the dog did. Uh, for no apparent reason, just suddenly he was running at my side. And he just bolted, he just stopped going straight to the heart of the left and went right between the legs. I go sailing in the air and I came down on my knees, except my right knee came down on a broken Coke bottle, Coca-Cola. And they used some thick glass back then. It was stuck nose down, way down. It was all broken up, but uh, it was the, the bottom all jagged that my knee just... You know, they said it went to the other side of your knee. They said, you got that whole field in your knee. But uh, when I got to the hospital, I sat there for a long time. The first doctor that came in just told my mom, right in front of me, you know, I'm in the room, you know. He said, I can't, I can't repair that. It's not repairable. We want to take it off. He can't use it. And I already knew that because when... As I started screaming and yelling for my dad, he finally came back. This field was behind our house. There was a chain link fence and then the field. Um, and, you know, my dad finally heard me. He got over, he saw the blood, and so all of a sudden he's scared to death. I'm going into shock. And uh, he got me to put my arm around his neck. And he said, can you walk on it? And I tried and it just collapsed. It was useless, it was, you know, it was off. And then I had to climb over that fence and my mom was going crazy and screaming and crying. And 
And he had to go take care of her. I'm sitting in his bathroom with my leg all opened up and I'm just getting sicker and sicker. Nauseating, scared, I was, I was a cripple. And, uh, but anyway, they get me down to the hospital. And this, like I said, the first doctor was really just like, we don't know what to do. And just right then, and God says he knew he was going to be there. This doctor walks by, and my mom recognizes me. And she goes, Dr. Kane. And she runs out the, out the door. Well, if it is Dr. Kane, her mammy that I mentioned earlier, uh, in her uh, old age, very old, maybe in her 90s, I don't know, late 80s, but uh, living with uh, her sister, uh, broke her hip. And this doctor repaired it. This is a long time ago, people. Repaired it, and she actually walked again with a walker. I remember. But uh, that's who this doctor was. And she said, my son, my son, they're going to take his leg off. You've got to come look at it. And th this doctor came, actually became uh, the medical doctor for the Houston Oilers. He repaired many of me before, before and after me. Um, I guess that's what he specialized in. But he was there at the hospital just to do rounds. He wouldn't dress for surgery or anything. And But he came in that room, and I mean, he was livid when he looked at my knee and knew how I'd been there for like five hours at this time. And he was he just started barking orders about getting me prepped for surgery, and he takes off to go get prepped. And they literally ran me down to surgery in a gunny. I mean, they were trying. He <laughs> just kind of fear he put in everybody. Anyway, I was in the hospital for weeks, and I woke up with a, with my leg. I was glad of that. They had a cast from my hip to my ankle. And uh, he told me, when, when I finally was being released, he said, if you put any weight on that leg, you'll never walk again. So, uh, I can't remember, six weeks. I don't know how long it was that I had that cast on it wasn't my first case, it wasn't my last. Uh, or maybe it was my first. Maybe it wasn't my last. <clears throat> That's another story. I'm not going, we're not getting very far. Uh, there's six chapters, I'm barely getting through the first one. But uh, what I'll do is I'll just do six, just like I did with Isaiah 53. I did uh, six or seven videos, seven I think. But then I, I joined them all together and put it as one video, the definitive commentary of Isaiah 53, which comes straight from God, by the way. I mean, you can contest what I'm saying all you want, but it makes perfect sense. For the first time, Isaiah 53 is explained. Now, how did I become the smartest religious Jew in the world who can see that? And, and what the wounding and the punishment, everything's about, and how it's, it's really, in some ways, uh, a snare for the Gentiles for the day of the Lord. Because he knows he can take me and just decimate any argument they want to put forth. You know, in particular, I'm blemished. I am not. I, I, I'm the Antichrist. In that, I am exact opposite of Jesus Christ. And, uh, he is so smart. He was teaching synagogue at 12. Supposedly he was a perfect, beautiful man. I'm disfigured. You know, I'm not bad looking, but I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, uh, Brad Pitt or anything. Anyway, um, and sinner, you know, uh, I was I tell God, well, what an habitual sinner. I, mean, I was a good person. I was good to other people. I was very compassionate. Um, I said there was already a lot of humble in me. I didn't love myself and the things I could do over others. You know, like being the fastest guy on top five at school and the fastest in the neighborhood, you know. I didn't brag on myself, but uh, as he took me back through my life I, <laughs> and informed me when things were sin, it, it just seems like I touched on all of them. And if murder in your heart is actually committing that sin, as the Christians say, I don't, I don't really go with that. But then there's really not much I've missed. <laughs> so I'm a sinner. And, you know, Jesus, all Jesus can say is, well, I'm a sinner too. I'm lying. All you got to do is read the scripture in the Gospels. You see where I'm lying. That's easy. And I came from the banish line. I thought I was the man of Isaiah 53. I thought I was going to be exposed to death, <clears throat> but given long life. This is what he would tell you if he was here. He said, but well, you know what happened? 
They crucified me. And on the cross, I realized I'm not that man. This is an exposure to death. This looks like a sure thing. Father, 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 why have you forsaken me? That's Jesus Christ saying, I'm not the man of Isaiah 53, and I just figured it out. That's what that is. I ask God sometimes, you sure you didn't have that written? Why on earth would they write that down? And they forget about it. We need to just think of me. That's what it's about, Christian. No, they got their way. To, they can explain that being counted a sinner means you, you, he got crucified with a, with a sinner beside him being crucified on each side, left and right. So there's three of them, so he's counted a sinner. Okay. You know, it's supposed to be discreet. We're supposed to be able to find a person to do this. You might tell, you might tell Judaism the same thing. You know, this is to find somebody. It's not the people of Israel. They, they're all kinds of people. Now, we're looking for a guy so God can have a Moses. Why? We have a new covenant. Why? It's the day of the Lord. Why? Jeremiah says so. That's why. It's so easy. The land blooms again. Okay, and he's coming with covenant friendship with the temple. So the land blooms again at a time when there's no temple. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. It's a metropolitan today. There's no Jerusalem of antiquity. The old city might be, old city might be too big. And I'll make a new covenant with you. I'm going to forgive all your sins and remember them no more. That will cause Torah to be written on your heart. It's a metaphor. When did he, let's think, huh, when did he do this before? Oh, that's right. Assyrian Babylon exiles, Isaiah was right before. God said, I forgive your sins, remember them no more. They became a holy seed, and what they did? They built the second temple. What are we missing? <laughs> the third temple. It's so easy. So it is the day of the Lord. There ain't any question of that. I'm just telling you, it started with the Russians. Sputnik, <laughs> old risky. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and he's bringing the covenant, but he's got to have a Moses. He said, I'm a sinner prophet like Moses. Though he's saying it's Joshua. No, it's not. God needs him today, the day of the Lord. And guess what? He gives us a description of him. He knows this is a time of secularism, reliance on science and medicine and doctors. And you got so many more people who the only book out there is not the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot more books than that. You know, there's all kinds of distractions, television, cell phones, computers. You know, back then, you know, you just sat around and said, what do you think God's doing? I don't know. Wish he'd send some rain. You know, it was just... I said, it's easier to get them back then. But um, here it is. It's here. And I said, and God said, you see why I put Shun and Despise in there? Because for a while, I said, God, you know, this is before we really got the books done and everything. I said, I'm just sitting in a room. I can't really tell anybody Shun and Despise in there. Counting me plagued, afflicted. And but God and everything else, he said, well, how you feel now that we've been putting all this on the internet and everything? I said, I feel shown in the spine. Yeah. I can tell they know. There's no question this hasn't gotten back to those two. I said, you keep attacking them like this, and I'll be certainly sure, just in case I'm wrong. But, because uh, he won't actually tell me. I, he won't tell me anything. This is a rule of thumb. He won't tell me anything that I cannot find out or become knowledgeable on or informed on of my own, which means about nothing because we're in a room all the time. The adjunct of the Holy of Holies, what I call it. I live in the Holy. I'm like the priest who can, the only person who could go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest. And that's what I'm like. As a matter of fact, God had me right down, just as he had David right down, uh, a new Psalm 151, where God said, and it's, it's on a video, well, God is speaking. For the Lord came to me and God said, quote, and uh, within that, he says uh, that he declared me. We actually used the song where he declares it for David. He declared me uh, an eternal priest in the order of Melchizedek and King David. 
and a rightful king, small k, and a rightful king. And uh, he also declared I'm the righteous servant. I mean, that's God talking. I mean, he's using it. When he dictated it to me, it wasn't, you know, to be written in my personality. That's him. That's him doing a new song. So, uh, because he does that. He, you know, even in the writings, the person doing the writing, who, whatever prophet it was, or Moses, or uh, David, if he wrote uh, Samuel 2 and Kings and Kings 1 until he died, um, as I say, God says, Look, just assume the central character is the one I had writing. Because their lives change when I come to them. Just like mine's changed. You know, this is not anything I could have ever conceived or even bothered thinking of. I'd have never read the Bible my whole life if he hadn't told me we're going to the bookstore and get you a tana. <laughs> that was 13 years ago. And I, my answer was, what's a tana? I didn't know anything. And look at all this knowledge. Um, but this is it. This is the only power he's going to use in creation. He's not going to perform miracles. He's not going to have me perform miracles. And he's not. He said, the only power I'm going to use is on you. What I can get you to do. I can, he, I, he said, I can take a Gentile Texan and take him to Israel and get my temple built. <laughs> okay. He said, because that's what you say to God all the time. Okay. Yeah. And he, you know, one night, I hadn't even read Isaiah 53. He didn't come to me and just say, offer yourself for guilt. I crushed you with cancer. It was me that did. That's not, I didn't, I wouldn't have known what he was talking about. We finally get to Isaiah a couple of years later. He said, keep read Isaiah 53. I said, okay. And so I read it. I said, okay, finish it. He said, who do you think that is? I said, I have no idea. I can barely read it. I didn't know what it's saying. I said, I think these two verses ought to be up here. I said, you sure nobody mess with this thing? He said, nobody mess with this. It's just that I had to say it right He said, that's you. I said, oh, okay. And I couldn't help myself. Good luck convincing anybody. I can't even tell what it's saying. He said, before we get done with that, he's right. I've been over that thing so many times. We, From my original version of Isaiah 53 that he dictated, or told me how to put together, and that every sentence, every word is, uh, we, we've changed it up and added things. I've learned things. Like, I didn't know about the test of devotion. I didn't know why the angel was leaving early in Malachi 3, but I do now. And all that would, would cause an amendment to my midrash on Isaiah 53. And, uh, you know, the book has me, these are all on videotapes now, me and Rashi. Rashi, the first one to come up with this is Israel. And, uh, you know, I look at his answers and I just shake my head sometimes. You should see his answer in Malachi 3 for the angel of the covenant that you desire. There's only a covenant of friendship and the covenant of Jeremiah. And this is his answer. He It's midrash, so he just takes a section of the angel is on the way, and it just says the angel of the covenant. And his commentary is the angel that avenges the revenge of the covenant. I said, what does that mean? What was he talking about? God said, God's being funny. He, he said, I don't know. I said, you do know. He said, well, I'm not telling you. So, God likes to, to feel as though he's laughing. He doesn't actually laugh. He sends me a perception that he does. Or he uses me to laugh. I've mentioned that in a video. Because he can't. Well, he controls my words. I learned that in uh, walking with him. Just one day, uh, I'm talking out loud as we go. We're, I'm discussing man and divine beings as though I had a sermon I was giving or a speech to somebody or a seminar. And I'm rolling, and I can tell he is really making this thing rock. He's taking it from here to here and here. And we're going, and uh, I'm going. And all of a sudden, I use uh, a word or a couple words that I simply don't use. And they're not what my mind was even thinking of. They just came out. And I just stopped. I said, did you do that? I didn't even say, hey, did you just make me say these two words? Because I knew, I knew he knew. <laughs> I said, did you do that? He said, I did. He was almost indignant. I did. 
I said, okay. But anyway, that's where it all started. Now I know. Okay. Guess who that is? That's the Holy Spirit. Using me. He doesn't sound like that. But he'll use words like that. So he's getting bored. They like to cut. I, I mean, let me just say this. This is part of God's, you know. No, I mean, it's not all the time. It's some of the times we we do tend to get kind of silly in here. But, you know, they do things after a while. I'm like, you know, I, it's like, I feel like a kindergarten teacher. And I got two of those kids that you just shake your head at. She said, this is a handful. These two are nothing but trouble. Always pulling around, looking for a laugh, and and uh, the spirit's always working in heaven. Death, God laugh, as it were. Again, he doesn't actually laugh. He just—it's a perception that that's his emotion. If God has any emotions left, because worrying about other people's pain is not one of them. <laughs> he made that clear to me. I don't care about your pain. And just saying it makes you mad. He says, "See, draw an angry." And he do so so many times over and over. He says, this is easy because now you're going to taste the fire out of it. He just, just started. I said, how do y'all keep doing this? I said, oh. And one day I told him, I said, I got it. I got it. Which means it actually came from them. I got it. I got it. You never grew up. You never got sent to your room. You never had to climb that mountain to achieve something. Put yourself out there. <laughs> Nobody's ever hoped you. He said, I said, that's what it is. You never grew up. That's what it is. Yeah, I'm dealing with the child guy. That's what I'm dealing with. That was my argument. And then he came down as mean, very serious, mature guy. And I didn't bring that argument up anymore. But that's how it gets with me sometimes. It's an incredible lie for, for me. Without, I'm not going to get to him. I guess I'm at the end. I'm getting close to when I got shot. I thought that was a new chip. Oh, it's not. Well, I'm gonna pick. This is getting long. Anything over half an hour, we try to stop. Now, my Isaiah 53 is five hours, but uh, yeah, you know, you know, I used to watch it all one time ago. He did not hardly let me watch it. Yeah, I don't even watch it before they get posted. He said, no, nah, no, nah, nah, you watch it later. Because it comes on my TV that he got me. And I didn't know at the time it was going to be, you know, that he was serious about doing videos. And I certainly didn't know about making it a backdrop. Yeah, he, he decides everything. You know, he tells me when to eat, when to get up. I don't sleep hardly at all, two or three night, hours a, a night and, and sometimes less. And take, take a half hour, hour nap sometimes. But I found out I feel fresh, you know, I don't need that much sleep. He said, well, you're not really doing anything. Why do you need a lot of sleep? And see, that used to make me mad. Now I'm just laughing at it. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll pick this back up on another video. And eventually, I'll put these first six chapters, just like I did Isaiah 53. Because it's a book that he dictated to me. I can't get it published. I'm going to put it on YouTube. That's why I'm reading it. And as I said, if you don't want to listen to it, don't listen to it. But uh, the information that's in these books and in those videos, is uh, it, that's my proof. And quite frankly, God says, if that's not enough for them, well, that's just too bad. Other destruction is what they end up getting. They better learn how to listen to the prophet. See, it's no different than the people back then. Y'all say, well, why didn't they listen to Isaiah? Why, or why didn't they listen to Ezekiel? Why didn't they? They laughed at Ezekiel. That's what Rashi says in his commentary. I didn't know it was laughing at him. But they just ignore him. Yeah, everybody thinks they know it. And, but in any event, uh, I do know there's, there's, there's one chapter we haven't put in there, and that is um, recognizing a prophet in town. It says uh, Moses vouched for Joshua, so he didn't have to be tested. Now, the problem with all that is, and I think why God had not had put it on video, is that they're looking for a seer, somebody who can see the future. But see, that's antiquity. I mean, that's not what you're looking for today. Moses wasn't a seer. 
And uh, none of the prophets were seers. They just wrote down what God told them to write down. God's the prophet. Uh, is the one making prophecy. <clears throat> and, and what he does, he doesn't actually just, quote, see the future. He walks it through. He says, okay, right, right here is when they're going to send up a satellite. This is where humanity will be at that time. He can walk it through in his mind. As I mentioned, his eyes, he doesn't have them. It's just his absolute knowledge of all things. He can form a picture of this room. Me, it's in here. He knows every atom of my body. And he just, it's like he does a vision for himself, a visualization. It's what I call when they put pictures in my mind. He says, uh, and he puts it into the spirit's mind. And they're both within me. You know, the big cloud that just came down. If, it, if you're sitting in a room with me, it envelops you. But it engulfs me, it goes through me. My little spirit cloud becomes part of the big cloud. That's why God is in his spirit. Here's the elements of spirit. Here's the elements of God's presence, his mind. Two clouds, they just come together. They can be together. Okay, but God's still one. He created the other cloud. And then, and then in this room, filled with them, it, my little spirit is like a little cloud that just came in and part of it. That, that's who I am. That's a man in divine beings. Okay? No, it, it's like nobody's really expecting it. Well, maybe it's because you didn't know these things. And now they want, they, you know, I get the feeling shunned. Shunned means I'm not looking at that. It's not like a coot. We, we, by faith, by the, by the fundamental principles of Fram Bam from the <laughs> town, from his uh, diagnosis of the town. Why don't you do your own? Why don't you throw the talent out and learn some new stuff? Why don't you get out of antiquity? Every religion has an end times like that. Every religion ends up with utopia for its people. Everybody. Well, don't be like everybody. You're the Jews. Throw it out. Let's get practical. Let's have God in our midst again. Ain't that man like he was in Moses? Let's point at him and tell the Christians that is the man of Isaiah 53. Here's what it's about. God said he's coming back. He, he told us, we're not waiting on him like you. And he said when he was coming back, he false prophesied five times. He ain't coming back. He wasn't who he thought he was. He told us on the cross. I'm not the man of Isaiah 53. He tells us. Well, that's what he doing. Why did you forsake me? I'm about to die. What do you think he's talking about? What do you think he's thinking about? You're not supposed to die. He thinks he's the man of Isaiah 53. So do they. It's just mind boggling because I'm the man. And there's nothing about me that says Jesus Christ. Nothing. You should hear me cuss God. I cuss him trying to die. I beg for death a thousand times. He says, it's not been a thousand times. I said, it's been hundreds. He said, well, that's true. You have cursed me more than any man in the history of mankind. And he said, and you did it face to the face. And I said, you shouldn't make me so mad. <laughs> he laughs, y'all. He laughs. He, when I'm cussing him, he did make some money. And they, oh, you're kidding. That's sorry. He gave me his perspective. This is how he did it. He said, Keith, imagine you created ants. And ants are living beings. In other words, they can think and they have emotion. Okay, you get a great big ant farm over here in your room. Okay, you decide you're going to get one ant to get all the other ants to do stuff. But you got to get him ready. And you get him ready the way I'm getting you ready. Now, he's mad at you. Right? I said, yes. Yes. And he said, now, magic... I'm always, always laying in this bed, I've got a big table, it's got a microwave on, I put my computer on, I've got a big fan I like to have on. And uh, he said, look over that table. Now imagine that ant got loose. And he is crawled up and he is standing on the corner of that table and he is giving you the what for in ant language. I mean, he's going. And he's turning around and shaking his butt at you and he's cussing and all this. And all you got to do is go bump and he's gone. I said, that's funny. And, and it is. And that's, that's how he, you know, that's what it does to him with me. You know, the spirit wild me up. I call him a troublemaker. Troubler. He's so funny. But um, God's so humorous. There's a difference in their humor. Okay, that wraps up. I'm told that does wrap it up. I'm going to pick up a gunshot. Um, it's it's, I guess it was worse than the accent to my knee. Uh, you know, they ended up opening me up from between my breast and my pelvic bone, and now it's been three times. 
and eventually, you know, the, the lung cancer and colon cancer and skin cancer. And, but the lung cancer is when they, they told me, you should have died from the colon cancer. He said, but uh, this is it. We can't treat that. It's too advanced. You're gone. And I'm prepared to die. Uh, that was 20 years ago when the planes hit New York. It was the planes hitting New York that got me up off the ground one last time to see one more doctor.